Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Ho, ho, ho. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we're kicking off our series on the Best Picture Oscar nominees of 1968 with Anthony Harvey's romp through royal discontent, The Lion in Winter. In the year 1183, Henry II, King of England, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, his wife, held Christmas court at their castle at Chinon. The occasion provided an opportunity for Henry to name his successor, to settle a dispute with the King of France, and to spend some time with his family. Don't fight me, Eleanor. What would you have me do? Give out, give up, give in? Give me a little peace. A little? Why so modest? How about eternal peace? Now there's a thought. Well, what do we have? The holly or each other? For these ten years you've lived with everything I've lost and loved another woman through it all. I could peel you like a pear and God himself would call it justice. What's your experience with the Lion and Litter? I have a wild fascination with British royalty. And I find British royal films about British royalty incredibly compelling. I don't always love them. Uh, but 
I just find the the way they operate to be crazy. And I really, there's something about them that I do enjoy. <laughs> this isn't my favorite one. In fact, I think from the previous time to now, I think it might have dropped a little bit on my uh, on my uh, as far as my opinions of it. But I still enjoy it, and I still find it uh, just interesting to kind of contextualize and and uh, and look at how it fits in with everything. Okay, so so how is that? And you actually bring up a really great point that your your fascination with British royalty. One of the things that I think is so interesting about this movie and this time, especially when we start talking about the controversy around the the uh, um, you know the tie in the best actress. Um, uh, Oscar later uh, is where this movie fits in terms of it, our 1960s cinema history and our absolute cultural fascination with British films at the time, uh, which I find fascinating. Yeah. This is such an interesting transition period, uh, I, I think. You know, when you when you look at just the way films were developed and where they were developed, um, and and what was going on in Hollywood through the forties, fifties, and sixties in this major transition, right? We were in the middle of this major transition over thirty years from as we move from, um, you know, the way we make movies and construct the systems that help us make movies. In the forties, we were making you know f- uh, an average of about four hundred movies a year. In the fifties, that declined to about three hundred movies a year. And in 1968, specifically, of the uh, the 300 films that were released in 1968, only 176 of those films were American films. The rest was sort of filled in the blanks uh, by these British films. And as it happens, there was this massive affinity for, uh, you know, all things British. And that brought us, you know, all these the great you know, music. We had the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and we had James Bond and we had I mean, we had all kinds of these major properties and major cultural uh, touchstones in popular culture in the 60s, thanks to uh, this uh, Anglophilia uh, going on in America. And this movie is uh, representative of that. Well, and that's that'll be actually an interesting thing to keep in mind as we go through this series. I mean, this series, you know, we're we're kind of celebrating films from 1968, films that are having their 50th anniversaries. And this final series of this big overarching series is the Best Picture nominees. And of the Best Picture nominees, I would say three of the five are British. Exactly. And look yeah. at the one that won. A British musical. Yeah, it's interesting times. These the you know the the late sixties and and sixty eight in particular is fascinating. And this film, it's an interesting one because well I don't know I uh, <laughs> it's interesting for a lot of reasons. I, I I think I had a good experience watching it. Had you seen it before or was this? I, I don't have a memory of ever sitting down and intentionally watching it from start to finish. I have memories of pieces of it now. I, as I reflect on it, that may be because there are sequences of dialogue in this film that are just rip roaring fantastic. Uh, there are great lines. It's a movie of great lines. Uh, it, it's actually, I think, also a movie of terrific individual performances. Uh, and strangely for me, it doesn't necessarily all of those performances and great lines don't add up to a sort of whole experience that leaves me completely satisfied uh, at, at the end of it. And so that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to this conversation, because I'd like to figure out why I respect this film um, for, you know, who's in it, what's going on in it, the story it's trying to tell, sort of fictionalizing this, you know, real point in history and doing the best they can to do it and still make it a sort of modernized, uh, the, using the language of modern modernized soap opera is a, a weird kind of mashup for me. Well, it is it is an interesting story um, that they're adapting here. This is, it was a play first. James Goldman had written the play, The Line in Winter, that ran a few years earlier and then adapted his own play for the, the, the uh, film. And uh, 
it it's an it, and the story that he he used for it is all about King Henry the uh, Second at Christmas 1183 and uh, King Henry's three sons uh, uh, Richard Philip and uh, John and his wife Eleanor Eleanor of Aquitaine who is uh, and this is where you get into kind of the the really interesting politics of all of it. Eleanor had been married to uh, King Louis in France, and then they uh, that their marriage was annulled. Uh, Henry married her, but she tried to overthrow. She tried to get her sons to overthrow the uh, the king, and he put her in jail. And she locked her. Up, he locked her up for. By the time this film is starting, she had been imprisoned for 10 years. She wants Richard to um, take the king, take the crown, and he wants John to after he dies. What's interesting about this is I think there's general consensus that the background of the story is generally accurate, although the bulk of the actual goings on is largely fictional. Um, there was no Christmas court in 1183. They did have one in 1182. Um, and, uh, just, I mean, there are a lot of elements in the story that, um, are just clearly just fictionalized, just added in for the purpose of making an interesting character piece to that end. I think it works. I think the characters are very interesting. Um, but my struggle, and, and I think I think that you seem to feel the same is that it does end up feeling a little a little bit like a soap opera and I think largely it's this it's this sense that the story is here for the story's sake so that we can watch these people interacting but I feel like by the time we get to the end there's no resolution it has not really taken us anywhere and that really struck me this time because uh, you know, we still don't know who's next in line for the throne. All we really know, according to the film, is that is that Henry and Eleanor have kind of repaired their bridges, I guess you could say, and and he sends her back to prison, <laughs> and they are happy. <laughs> <laughs> it it is a, a deeply confusing uh, uh, final moment in the film the way they are laughing gleefully at each other i think is is a perfect punctuation to some incredibly confusing dramatic moments throughout the entire film just when you think that there's going to be some resolution in a positive direction uh between these two and they're using the language of reconciliation it turns on a dime and becomes uh you know cutting incisive language of rage and hate but it's uh but it's it delivered through just by these forked tongues on on the parts of all parties. I don't know who I'm supposed to uh, uh, follow and appreciate and look for growth here in this film. We have this massive star, uh, Catherine Hepburn, um, and, uh, you know, she has, uh, you know, had a fantastic career and she's just a, you know, I, I, you read about other people, film scholars writing about this movie and they, you know, uh, they all say essentially the same thing. The title purportedly is referring to the lion as Henry, but not in the movie. That lion is uh, Catherine Hepburn, uh, and she would have appreciated, you know, the lion role and not the the uh, more diminutive in her eyes lioness. Uh, she is the lion in winter in this case. So am I to follow her and look for her, or is this a Peter O'Toole thing? Am I supposed to follow Henry and his his charge to get his, uh, you know, his idiot son John on the throne? Uh, I, I'm just. Uh, it is a soap opera. And once I wrap my head around that, it's great. I, I enjoy all the intrigue. I, I'm just not sure I enjoy it for as many loop-de-loops that they take me on, as many turns, as many fakes and handoffs uh, and plots that they take me through um, to the end of the movie without actually giving me any sort of resolution. It just sort of stops. I think that's largely the struggle with it. Um, I don't know if I completely um, buy into that she's the lion. I think, um, well, I, it really, it could be either one of them. They're both very lion-like, and, and she even has that line toward the end of the film about how 
uh, you know, we're jungle creatures. And yeah, I, I think yeah. that kind of defines that. And, and earlier in the film, she talks about how they are the barbarians. It really is this period in in uh, history when things were much more bar- barbaric and awful and the way that the decisions were made and and um, these games, these political games were played all feels um, uh, like a much, uh, I don't think crass is the right word, but um, a, a much kind of a, a baser form of all of these things. You know, mm-hmm. I, I feel like um, their world was, uh, or their their way of approaching everything was as um, as rough edged as the places that they lived. Um, yeah. And it makes for, I don't know, it just, it makes for a really interesting period of time. And, and, you know, you have these people bargaining over land. I mean, really, that's what this largely is, is, is everybody fighting over uh, whatever land they can acquire. And uh, that's largely the battles that they're having, which it, it, you know, it's, it's funny because they're all so despicable and angry and, and argumentative people that it's hard to really side with anyone. And I think if it wasn't for having Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn uh, playing the two leads, I think it would be a very hard story to kind of get in tune with. I did not expect this out of you. I thought you were going to like this movie. I have to tell you, I thought you were no, going to like it a like lot. It. No, no, no. I, I thought this was going to be a movie that you would you would get behind to a greater degree. I, it surprises me that that you and I are on the same page on this. Well, I am too, actually, because my memory of this film was that I really loved it. And um, walking into it this time, I, I found myself struggling with it more than I had in the past and uh, really kind of questioning some of the the way that the story unfolds and kind of the quality of the story that we have here. I mean, I think it's an absolutely fascinating character piece. Don't get me wrong. I just, um, I, I think I was hoping for something that gave me a little bit more of the meat of kind of what was really going on with all of these uh, really fascinating people. Yeah, I think so. And the closest I think we get to that is the relationship between um, uh, Philip and and Richard, right? Where you know we have some, uh, I think, some of the best performances in the film in a film full of interesting and and you know robust performances. Uh, that we have these sequences between Dalton and Hopkins, James Bond versus Hannibal Lecter. J- James, yes. <laughs> He uh, they this is wonderful turn on the mysteries of, you know, Richard the Lionhearted's noted homosexuality or rumored homosexuality and that there's this wonderful scene and stare down between the two of them. You know, you didn't write. I didn't I didn't write because I didn't think you'd write me back. You know, it's just a a, a fantastic turns of phrase, uh, incredible performances uh, between these two stoics of the screen in their uh, arguably their film debuts. I I think there's some argument about Hopkins role, but even Hopkins says this was his film debut. and it's just an incredibly powerful sequence. And then the sequence sort of comes off the rails because everybody's in the room hiding behind tapestries and they even hang a lantern on that. Right. What else yeah. are tapestries for? <laughs> uh, which is it, it sort of lights up the ridicule of this whole sequence and that construct that we're sitting in this thing that is stretching and reaching to be vaudevillian in its humor and also portray the seriousness of the the. Um, the gamble that each character is is playing, I think, is um, it, it is interesting at times, troubling at others and and confusing the rest. It's a story that very easily could become a Shakespearean comedy. Yes. And that that scene in particular really struck me as the way that everybody's hiding behind the the tapestries and one person's coming out and the next person. And it just it, it felt very potentially comedic. Um, obviously it didn't go down that road, but it could have. And I think that speaks to kind of the, the, um, the kind of the grand, uh, uh, tones that the film takes because it feels very much that way where everything is taken at this heightened level. And in this particular case, it's just a much more serious level, but it could easily go down that same road for something a little more light and jovial. The screenplay is interesting. You know, we were talking about the, um, you know, the the 
production. Uh, you know, it's a it's a period that is really interesting, and it's not a period that uh, you know it that that lights up the way Shakespeare lights it up, the way modern takes uh, like it up and one of the, or light it up and and they uh, you know you can tell they really um, went to some length to attempt a production design that was of the period uh, and you know uh, Goldman writes an interesting little note in the uh, opening of the screenplay uh, where he says uh, the line in winter was a special and peculiar sort of history play to make its style and intention clear on film the look of the castle where it occurs and the sense of castle life needs to be <laughs> earthly real and at the same time strikingly different from what we're used to seeing in King Arthur movies almost nothing is known about the castle at Chinon as it was in Henry's time and little enough is known about 12th century castles in general one thing is clear however and important for our purposes only that such castles look nothing like we expect and he goes on to describe uh, the filth of these castles the way that the the royalty and the you know the sort of villagers and the towns people so they all live and sleep together and they it's uh, you know filthy and made of wood uh, not stone and uh it, it just sort of teeming with life but it's it's early not shiny uh life uh, not polished and uh that this movie at the time in 68 was something of a standout in in terms of its production design and and the way it portrayed these people living in these castles uh what's your sense like how did you how did you find yourself being able to uh, adapt to the world did it did they sell it oh absolutely i loved everything about this world it felt grungy it felt old it felt like uh an interesting side of kind of that uh, royal british world that I hadn't seen because it was so long ago. Every like the castles just seem kind of run down. There's hay all over the floors. There's always chickens and dogs everywhere. Um, I thought it was a brilliant way to kind of play this world because it just felt real. I, like even the moment when he's um, like woken up in the morning and he breaks the ice off of the the um, bowl of water so that he can take some cold water and splash it in his face. I just thought everything about. Uh, the world that they created here felt uh, incredibly authentic. I, I loved all of those elements. I did too. I, I found it really sort of expert kind of crafts, craftsmanship, like literally, like, literally craftsmanship. Uh, again, from the uh, you know from the script, living conditions even for royalty were crude and rough. Castle rooms are Spartan. A bed, a few chairs, chests for storage, clothes hung in open in the open on racks. Uh, everything that you would need to to stand up against a siege must be in the facility poultry livestock looms and tailors mills for grinding grain vast storerooms water wells boot makers gardens uh everything vital to life i think they sold it so well with the look of of this thing so yeah. well costumes everything it's just it looks real nice and you know it's funny because i was thinking about that while watching it this film was shot by douglas slocum who we've talked yes. about on the show before uh the cinematographer that uh, spielberg worked with on the indiana jones films or at least the first three um i was really kind of surprised because there was such a staginess to the way that they made those i mean obviously it was it was for the films but in my head i guess i was just i wasn't expecting something that had such kind of heft to the 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 look of it um uh, to be done by him and it, so it was really impressive i mean well he had done some what were the other things that he, that he did some of the uh, ealing films right yeah Kind early Hearts on, and Coronets, I think we, oh, exactly. lavender hill mob man in the white suit right so he did those yeah. Um, I, I guess in my head, I just I, I focus on the on the the uh, Indiana Jones films. But um, I, I mean, he 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 does just as much work as Anthony Harvey and all the other craftsmen involved in the film to bring this world to life. It really is uh, just a rock solid world that they create here. I don't know why. One of the things that caught my eye in terms of costume design that uh, Richard's cloak He's wearing the fur inside, you know, in 
And yeah. so many films have these luxurious cloaks of skins where they're wearing the fur out to show off kind of the voluptuousness of the fur that they've designed, but not at all real to how they would have been worn for for warmth, you know. And and so I, I noticed that like those little things, I think, are nice touches and, and a, a bits of attention to detail uh, that I think work really, really well. It really does. It's it's really nice the way that it all plays. And, uh, you know, if if anything feels dated to me, um, not necessarily dated 1183 dated, but dated 1968, it's the use of zooms. And uh, it's funny because listening to Anthony Harvey talking about it on the commentary, he really, in, in retrospect, he looked back and was like, what was I doing with all of those zooms everywhere? <laughs> And and he's just like, I don't know why I felt like I needed to do that. And I agree. I mean, there there are times where he uses some really distracting zooms. And I uh, I know it's the 60s and it was just a, a time where um, zooms were a little more in fashion. But now watching them, it's like, gosh, I wish that they had found another way to put some of those things together. Yeah, it's a, that is an interesting point. And it is a thing that truly dates the look of the film. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like I kind of write it off immediately when I see it as, oh, this was, you know, a 60s film. But yeah. uh, goodness, that one touch would make this film timeless. Like it really could make this timeless. That's such a such a, a tool of an era. There, well, there are some other weird like camera shots, and and I I don't know if they're specifically sixties, but for there are a few times where he allows the actors, usually Peter O'Toole, to end up like really close to the camera, like Peter O'Toole storming down the hallway about something, and he comes right up to the camera, is like screaming in the camera, you know, before um, before we cut to the next shot, and it's it's a little off putting to have those. Um, those moments where he lets them kind of get into that space. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, I guess it's not, it, it doesn't necessarily make it um, um, worse to watch like the zooms can, but it's just an interesting style to have employed. Yeah, see, that's int that's an interesting perspective. I see, I can see that more as a, as just a stylistic thing that you might see in in other films. That doesn't scream to me as of an era as as much as this right, uh, right, as the zooms do. I you know I want to go back just real quick to to something we started talking about early on, which is Henry, the character of Henry himself, and some of the challenges I have with him because especially after watching the whole film. You get a sense that this guy who is presumably our, you know, kind of protagonist, the guy we're going to follow, Henry's journey to fill the seat, uh, is a terrible judge of character. And he's surrounded by terrible people. And all the people that are surrounding him are his own children and the, the his <laughs> wife that he imprisoned. And it makes for a really, I guess it's interesting. I guess it's an interesting sort of character study. But I look at the the very opening description uh, in their duel when we cut first from Henry to his opponent in the duel. It says, cut to the opponent from Henry's POV. It's John, his son of 16, who in 18 years was to become the worst king in English history. I think from a screenwriting perspective, that's a really nice choice on be on the part of James uh, Goldman, because here we get this history that demonstrates not only who John the character is, uh, who is now a whelp, uh, but who will uh, soon fulfill his destiny to be the king of the whelps, uh, <laughs> but, but also demonstrate that Henry is giving his time and attention to someone who is the worst. And it's funny, I didn't realize... Uh, I probably did as I like last time I watched it, but had forgotten like who these sons were, how the oldest son actually does become King Richard the Lionheart and the youngest son ends up becoming King John, the King John in all the Robin Hood stories, the Robin Hood stories. Right. And now all I can think of is the is the uh, the uh, thumb sucking lion king that we have in the animated version because <laughs> it just it ends up fitting very much with this uh, kind of buffoon that we see here. It's very interesting. So what what's your take on Henry, though? What's your take on Henry as uh, as the vessel through which we are to see this whole story as Henry, the, the great king, Henry and, and patriarch? Again, it's just it's it's interesting because Henry is obviously 
He's greedy. He wants a lot of land. And he is all about his uh, kind of uh, keeping his treasures and keeping the name for himself and everything. And um, it's it's so strange. I think really, I mean, he knows that Richard is the right choice. But because Richard sided with Eleanor, he um, refuses to go that route and instead picks John of all kids, who's like the, the most idiotic choice. So it's watching Peter O'Toole play this character. I, I find him big and blustery and clearly having fun in the role. It's it's a it's an enjoyable role for anyone because he's he's always plotting and planning and and making these decisions. But really, these decisions are just other parts of his plans. And I, I think O'Toole brings it. And, you know, for a guy who is only in his 30s and here he's playing somebody who is 50, I, I, I felt the age. I felt the kind of the, uh, you know, the 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 scheming. And um, it, he's a hard character to like, but I really enjoyed watching him nonetheless. Yeah, I did, too. And, you know, you can say the exact same thing, I think, about everybody else in here, even the yeah. whelp, you know, John, played by Nigel Terry, who, uh, it, you know, has some brilliant, brilliant lines uh, that I'm, I, I just love, you know, when he's gets so upset because everybody has given up on him and he's turned he like huddles down by the fence and says poor john who says poor john don't everybody sob at once my god if i went up in flames there's not a living soul who'd pee on me to put out the fire (laughs) just i just Uh, uh, love that and then uh anthony hopkins has a great line after that where he's just like let's strike a flint and see (laughs) (laughs) i i love it uh uh, yeah, I mean, th- this is this is the juice of this. I think this is a performer's uh, movie, you know, I mean, this is a, a and, and a play, a performer's play. This is designed for uh, for great actors to just chew on. And uh, it's in that regard, it doesn't really matter how the arc of the narrative plays out, because really, it's easy to get lost in in these individual performances. Yeah, but in the end, I, I do still feel where by the time it's done and I've enjoyed the ride, I then go, wait a minute, what was I just chewing on there? And it's it's like yeah. cotton candy where you're like, I enjoyed yeah. it, but I don't remember, you know, where we went with that. And that for me is is the thing that still ends up frustrating because in the end, I, I you know, he seems to have kind of repaired his relationship with Eleanor, yet he's But only until her- the next holiday season. Well, yeah, because he still sends her back to prison. Um, you know, it, it's I don't know. It's just it's uh, his his sons. He's he's no longer going to Rome. I guess that was stopped. Um, you know, to annul his marriage, and nor his nor is he keeping his sons locked up. He couldn't he couldn't execute them. So I guess to that end, that's that's really what the crux of the story is. That you know he's he realized that you know that's not a path he can take. And uh, is going to have to figure something else out. But yeah, his we sons don't get are gone. to find out what that is. Exactly. <laughs> it is unresolved and very strange, right? It's just yeah. it's just over. Uh, so I, I struggle with that. I can absolutely see how, uh, you know, others, I think, are in the right calling this a, an absolutely great film. It's certainly, to, to my eye, it merits being in this list, even though I struggle with it in, in these parts. It is such a performer's piece. Uh, that that I give it uh, certainly give it credit for that. You want to talk Definitely. about uh, where yeah. it came from? Well, this was uh, this was a film. It was a Broadway show. Uh, it ran in nineteen sixty six. I guess it was a flop. It didn't sound like it um, uh, really succeeded much at all. Which um, is uh, interesting because it still did well at the Tonys. Um, it's an interesting cast too. It's one of those where I'd be really curious to see it. Robert Preston played uh, Henry. Rosemary Harris played Eleanor and Christopher Walken played King Philip. Wow. Very interesting uh, grouping there. And Rosemary Harris did win a Tony for her performance. And uh, now all I can do is, is picture uh, the music man and Aunt May and, and the Walken, uh, you know, putting this show on. It's, it's yeah. a crazy trio to see um, uh, putting it on. But, um, 
uh, this, you know, um, Goldman had adapted his uh, his script into or his play into a script, as I said earlier, and Harvey came across it. And I'm not sure if it was Joseph E. Levine who uh, put him uh, onto it or somebody else. Interestingly, Joseph Levine, you know, we just talked about the producers with Mel Brooks, same producer on this film as well. Um, uh, but Harvey thought it was a really interesting script and wanted to do it. He talked to Goldman and, and Goldman was good and they were getting ready to go. Interestingly enough, Peter O'Toole had seen this little film called The Dutchman, which Anthony Harvey had made. It was his first film, very small film. Somehow O'Toole came across it and, you know, he wanted to work with Harvey and and said he'd do this. And and he's the one who kind of brought uh, Catherine Hepburn on because uh, she wanted they wanted to work on something together. And so it's interesting that they were able to uh, kind of pull all that together to, uh, you know, to get to this point where they were making this movie. And it's nice to see that uh, the the play might have been a flop, but the film wasn't. I mean, they, they managed to put something on that actually uh, really was popular. God, I, I am stymied by that. I am stymied why the play uh, as to why the play was not more successful. It seems like something that audiences were just ready to go suck up. And uh, I can't imagine that Robert Preston and Rosemary Harris and Christopher Walken were any less Im- compelling uh, than, you know, O'Toole and Hepburn and Dalton and Hopkins on screen. I j- it's, I'm, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is. Very interesting. Very interesting. We've talked about Anthony Harvey uh, by name only. We should talk about him more here as the director of the film. Ah, yes. Anthony Harvey, um, we have talked about some projects that he's been involved in as an editor, because that's where he started his work. Um, He had done um, a couple films in uh, the 50s and uh, then then got in touch with uh, Stanley Kubrick and saying, I'd love to work with you. Kubrick brought him on to do Lolita and a film we've talked about, Dr. Strangelove. And uh, he did a few more films before he uh, finally decided to switch over to directing. And that's what he did in the mid 60s and uh, kind of continued his directing career into the 90s. Um, And uh, yeah, I don't think uh, we've ever talked about him otherwise other than Dr. Strangelove. But he's he's one of those guys that I think um, has a sense of telling a story. And I think editors, there's a there's a, a sense that they have of how to kind of find a story un- unfold and in fact there's a scene that he shot with o'toole that uh it's toward the end of the film when he's talking to um to alice and it's quite a long monologue he said it was like a 10 minute mo- monologue and it was very impressive he said o'toole's performance was was stellar and when they premiered it and you know he had cut it because he just felt in context of the story they were at a point in the film where we needed to get moving. And so he cut it and O'Toole was furious with him and, and like kept bothering him. And for years he would kind of just randomly show up on his porch and say, Hey, are you still, you got to add that shot back in or that scene back in <laughs> because he felt like it was, it was like the crux of his performance. And, you know, Harvey admits it was a brilliant performance. And he says that probably was the best part of, of O'Toole's performance in the entire film. But it slowed the film as a whole down. And so to that end, it had to be cut. Well, and for um, a film that is an actor's film, you can absolutely yeah. see why O'Toole would come back at him about this. Oh, definitely. Uh, but definitely. this movie is not short at two hours and, what, 14 minutes uh, yeah. already to add another 10-minute monologue by the king. Right, right. I'm done. Yeah. Especially late in the game where you are, you are really wanting to get, right. get things moving along. But, you know, they still loved working with working with each other. They did another project together in the 80s called Svengali with uh, with uh, O'Toole and uh, Jodie Foster. I haven't seen it. It was a TV I thing, right? It. Wasn't that a made for TV movie? Uh, it was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how about uh, the good uh, James Goldman? Uh, I, I don't think we've ever actually talked about uh, James Goldman, but we have talked about William Goldman, his his bro. Yeah, interesting um, uh, lineage that he comes from. He's uh, he's done uh, quite a number of plays. I think this was probably the one that got the most attention. Um, and then some screenplays. And I think that uh, They Might Be Giants, Nicholas and Alexandra, I, I was, uh, I believe, a uh, Best Picture nominee. I don't know if he was nominated for an Oscar for his writing. 
Robin and Marion, um, another a Robin Hood story there, and White Knights. So um, an interesting set of, uh, of films that he had written for the screen. I did uh, the one that stuck out to me uh, is, is one that I may need to save for to drop some at some point on our uh, Saturday matinee. Uh, it is the 1995, not so much a hit, Cyber Bandits. Uh, have you did did you come across this one in your research? Uh, no, and I'm looking at his stuff and I don't even see it, which is funny. It, is because he so. didn't write it under his own name. And oh, that's okay, why I'm not <laughs> but listen to this. A navigator aboard a millionaire's yacht, Jack Morris, discovers that the millionaire's mistress has stolen the data for his secret virtual reality. To escape, they encrypt, miniaturize, and tattoo the data onto Jack's PL colon back. I don't know what that is. The pair share a VR adventure on the run from the millionaire's thugs, meeting up with a wild series of characters. What is wow. that all about? I want to see that Jack Goldman hit. Everything else is like The Light in Winter, exactly. Oliver Twist, Anna Karenina, <laughs> Tolstoy. <laughs> yeah, he wrote this one under the name Winston Beard. Oh, interesting. Yeah, for what that's worth. Anyway, interesting <laughs> character. Uh, and uh, and But again, rip-roaring, strong dialogue. I mean, there are great, great sequences of of uh you know of of text in here of of it it's just it's, it's some good stuff it's solid it's it's funny it's yeah. funny in eleven eighty three that was not a very funny time <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no it how, wasn't. how about uh Eleanor Catherine Hepburn? This is not a very funny time for her either. She'd taken a little break after the death of her um, uh, of Spencer Tracy, who she was with for a long time right. on screen and off. And uh, he had passed away after the um, uh, guest who's coming to dinner um, had found some <laughs> its its early success. And and uh, she took a break. She went back to the East Coast uh, for not very long. But as, as it turns out, Peter O'Toole, who was a, a good friend of hers and she had been quite an advocate of his uh for many years he called her and he said this is the script and you need to read it and she called the next day and said do it before i die as peter <laughs> o'toole says and and she signed on right away uh and so this was the the uh, the film that got her out of uh that, that brought her, her back slump. into to films i yeah there's i think it's yeah. hard to say that Catherine hepburn had a, a slump but certainly out of <laughs> mourning uh yeah, and yeah. and led into the next 30 i mean she was 60 when she did this movie and it led to the right. next you know 30 years of of fantastic performances uh, from her it opened the door to a new chapter for for Catherine hepburn i would say and and it's uh, it is a great performance performance it really is it's it's a big performance and uh but there's a lot of stuff going on and, and a lot of interesting conversations <laughs> quiet dear mommy's fighting <laughs> it's so good yeah just there's so many so many things throughout yeah. and she just plays it spot on so uh it's it's a delight to see her on screen and to really see her and o'toole battling opposite each other i just i think that that is a fantastic pairing that uh i really relish watching it's just so much fun seeing the two of them uh duking it out here totally and it, almost as exciting as as seeing them together was seeing anthony hopkins in his you know in his early <laughs> early beard uh <laughs> it, i it took me a while because i had forgotten that he was in it and i saw the credit come on screen and i sort of sat up i leaned in andy i leaned in to the couch and i said <laughs> all right where is hopkins and he's in front of my face probably for 15 minutes before i realized oh god that's hopkins right there <laughs> that he's was right him. there <laughs> he's yeah. a very is is not just a bit part uh he's richard uh what'd you what'd you think of of his performance here you know i i think uh i i thought he's fantastic and 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 for an early film role it's clear that he already is is able to kind of carry uh carry a performance on the screen and opposite big figures like uh o'toole and hepburn he's just he's great and you already mentioned the standout scene when he's talking to uh king philip that scene is just so so touching and poignant and then it rips your heart out right afterward 
um, as as King Philip, um, you know, kind of squeals on on Richard to his father, and yeah. it just it's so interesting the way that that all plays out. And this that's what I find really interesting about this film, and I think that's why you call it a film, uh, an actor's film, because. There are there's so much um, fighting and so um, the emotions within every character is just on constant roller coasters back and forth. It allows them to give a lot to their performances, and Hopkins certainly does here. He tells the story of uh, of Hepburn giving him advice uh, after their first little bit of shooting, and he says, <laughs> "She comes to me and she says, stop acting. Uh, look at all the great American actor performances. They're not acting. They're just do it. They show up and they deliver the lines and they just do it. Stop acting. You'll let me do the acting. I'll act all over the place, but you you stop acting." And he said, "It turns out it works. <laughs> that was great advice." <laughs> How funny! The only other person that I really wanted to talk about was John Barry with the score. Um, um, I have always loved this score. There's something about kind of the choral elements of it that I think also heighten that sense of the period that we were talking about earlier. I love the, just the way that it unfolds and just kind of this this intense um, darkness that it also has. Like everything about it feels um, big and ominous and it works so well for the film. I love the score. I do too. Um, it, it is... an I want to go back to the script again, because I think this is an interesting bit where, again, on the second page of of the script, he writes a note about music. Uh, On the stage, Christmas carols were used for incidental music in good effect. Carols used were from all periods. There is something available through musical style, using medieval instruments to play 19th century tunes with contemporary harmonizations that should have a considerable help in letting an audience know that it's an odd and different kind of history show that they're seeing. The point to be made here is that the music is a useful and important element. It wants to be crisp and clear and spirited and, above all, distinctive. That is, it needs to have a sound we haven't heard before. And because the style of the writing involves a mixing of odd elements, it seems right that the freshness of musical sound should be achieved the same way. Does Barry live up to that? Goldman wrote all that? Yeah. On the script? Yep. That sounds like a theater playwright. (laughs) It does? Putting putting that in. It doesn't sound like something that uh, any writer would be allowed to write, especially these days. Uh, It's very funny. I I think so. I I do think so. There's this gothic uh, element to it that I think um, does heighten the experience. And I think I think it works. The the movie, I I guess we have just a couple of facts and, and tidbits. Uh, the only one that I thought was really interesting is a bit of a throwback that we're, I think, seeing a resurgent uh, resurgence of today, and that is how this movie was marketed when it was initially released. It was not marketed uh, as just a regular old go buy your ticket and sit in the theater thing. Uh, it was marketed as a high end theater experience where interesting, uh, yeah, you had to buy a seat. And audiences were paying top dollar for tickets. You were going as if you were going to see something on the stage. Uh, And it was this movie. And uh, uh, that ended up helping its its initial release. That's like going to Fathom Events. (laughs) It's exactly like going to Fathom Events. That's so funny. Yeah. I paid top dollars to see the Wiggles. Let me tell you. (laughs) I, I wouldn't say it was worth it. It's no lion in winter. <laughs> the wiggles in winter. <laughs> so, so, oh, probably would have been better. Well, I found a little bit of information that I thought was absolutely fascinating. Catherine Hepburn is actually a descendant of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, so she's portraying her own ancestor in this film, wow. which is really cool. Uh, she's uh, descended from Eleanor in several lines, from both Eleanor's marriage to uh, Louis the Seventh, the King of France, also to Eleanor's marriage to Henry the Second. And so, um, because, you know, they're all like cousins and they're all sleeping together. It's a very <laughs> strange period. That's true. But there it is. So she is actually of uh, descended from that royal blood. Pretty interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, now we we've talked about the fact that this was originally a play in '66, but that's not yes. all we've seen of the no, Lion in Winter. No, it's not right. Aside from the other uh, theatrical productions, of which there have been a number, uh, there was a 2003 TV movie version of it that was adapted, uh, starring um, none other than uh, Captain Jean Luc Picard himself, Patrick Stewart, and Glenn Close uh, playing Eleanor. I remember. 
uh, hearing reviews of it that it was good, but I didn't watch it. I haven't seen it either, but that's one yeah. that I'm I am more curious now to see it now that we've uh, sure we've seen this one. Let's talk about uh, its performance at award season. Highly well, controversial. It I I don't know if it's highly, but it's uh, I I don't even know if it's controversial really. But it had fifteen rare. wins, eighteen it's other rare, nominations. It is rare. That's the right word. This is the film that uh, that Hepburn tied Best Actress with Barbara Streisand. Um, she won for Funny Girl, as we've talked about on the show before, and Hepburn won for this. And funny story that Anthony Harvey tells: um, he did not win for Best Director. But uh, and he had forgotten that, you know, Catherine Hepburn does not like award ceremonies. She thinks it's nonsense. And so she wasn't there. And she said to Anthony, if if I win, just say something for me. And so he was relieved that he didn't have to say anything for for a winning best director. But then he forgot that he had to talk for um, her because she won. And so he kind of stumbled his way up the stage. And in the process of doing so, he accidentally stepped on Barbara Streisand's dress and ripped it down the backside. <laughs> and as, as he says it, he says it was, it, he was up on the stage. And uh, so uh, he spoke first and then Streisand spoke afterward. And he said, and he was standing behind her and here was Barbara Streisand speaking. And they were both giggling because he was basically just staring at her butt, which was just hanging out of her dress because <laughs> it was ripped wide open. That's a horrible story. No, <laughs> imagine just living with that the rest though, of your geez. life. Oh my goodness! As Streisand, you know, it's an interesting thing about Streisand. Uh, you finish your finish your story. I got an interesting thing to say, and it involves Gregory Peck. Uh, well, the movie also won for best uh, adapted screenplay, best original score. Uh, John Barry, uh, best original score, not a musical. Uh, it was a very important delineation back in those days. It was also nominated for best picture. It lost to Oliver, which we'll be talking about soon. Peter O'Toole was nominated, but he lost to Cliff Robertson for Charlie. This was interesting. Peter O'Toole became the second actor after Bing Crosby to be twice nominated for an Oscar for portraying the same character. He had por- previously portrayed King Henry II in Beckett just four years earlier. Um, uh, Harvey was nominated for Best Director, but lost to Carol Reed for Oliver. And costume design was nominated, but lost to Romeo in Juliet. So Gregory Peck had just taken over as the head of the Academy of the MPAA. Uh-huh. And he, he actually, this is part of the controversy of the tie, uh, is that he allowed Streisand to become a member of the Academy for a number of different reasons before she had sold a single ticket for Funny Girl. Uh, he saw her and knew she was doing the film and had seen her on stage. and went ahead and gave her uh, and and brought her into the academy um uh, as a member a voting member before she had done her requisite three films you had to have three films in order to get into the academy um at that time and so she hadn't she didn't have one and so he okayed it and that was the controversial part that uh, uh. she ended up in there there were a total of 3030 voting members for um the best picture award and as a result of nobody knows exactly how many people uh, or how many members of those 3030 uh voted for either side but it was an exact tie the rules said it had to be an exact tie uh for votes and and um, prior to i think it was prior to this year um it was you have to get within 3 votes of a tie and then it becomes a tie but here it was an exact tie um and wow. and it, it, so you know the 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 line is if she should be thanking anybody Streisand on stage she should be thanking Gregory Peck because it it's likely her own vote that caused it to be a tie that year. Wow, isn't that interesting? That's funny, very right. interesting. Yeah. Uh, how to do at the box office, Andy? The budget to bring these jungle creatures to the big screen was four million dollars, which is about twenty seven point seven million in today's dollars. O'Toole and Hepburn hit the theaters on October 30th, 1968, and from what I could see, it actually looks like they had the weekend uh, to themselves, which was good for the film, as it did really well at the box office, coming in number 12 that year and raking in $22.3 million, which is about $154.3 million in today's dollars. All told, this tale of British royalty ended up doing well for itself, making an adjusted profit per finished minute of $945,000. 
I wonder now, knowing about that uh, uh, reserve seating stuff, just how much that played into its opening weekend success. I wonder if you I wonder. Wonder. That's it, Andy. I think see what I did there. It. See I how did. I, I yeah yeah see? you did. No, you're a you you, you, you too are Very clever. descended from British royalty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure somewhere. That's right. <laughs> I think we need to rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you'll see all the movies we've ever talked about on this film. Flickchart.com slash the next reel. You know the drill. And if you swipe over in your show notes and you tap flick chart, it should take you directly to this film where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up to ours. All right. First up, we have The Lion in Winter or Fat City. Uh, I'm thinking uh, Lion in Winter. Yeah, it's a it's a close one for me. But yeah, it's Lion in Winter. Yeah. The Lion in Winter or Fargo. Definitely Fargo. Fargo, absolutely. The Lion in Winter or Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. I think it would be easier if if this was Lady Vengeance that we're talking about, Mr. Vengeance. I think I'm going to go Lion in Winter, but I think largely it's just my fascination with British royalty that's winning out because I could I could be swayed for the other direction. I think, you know, I think I'm going to go with Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. I think I'm going to go with it, and I'm not going to build a, a, a much of a case. It's just uh, it, one of those sort of wacky and weird enough... Uh, uh, films and I so you know I find myself thinking fondly about that whole trilogy, uh, with the exception of Lady Vengeance. Uh, <laughs> the whole trilogy, the whole trilogy, third two of thirds of the trilogy, uh, <laughs> uh, quite fondly uh, after that experience. Even though I love the scene chewing dialogue in in Lion and Winter, so I could be swayed too. I'm definitely just on one side of the fence, just barely. Well, since we're both there, I feel like we're going to just have to rock paper scissors. All right, let's it. just do it, just for you okay. know, for the kids. Right. Yep. One, One, two, three. three. Scissors. Rock. All right. All right. That doesn't feel that bad, right? It, it, it nope, feels like doesn't feel it that feels bad. good. All right. The Lion in Winter or Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Sweeney I'm Todd. I'm going to go with Sweeney Todd. Yes, yes you are. Sir. The Lion in Winter or High Noon. Uh, High Noon. I think I'm High Noon. I, boy, I didn't like it as much, uh, but I didn't like this as much. So That's what I, I knew you were going to say that, yeah. too. Yeah. I'm going to say High Noon. There you go. The Light of Winter or Mad Max? Absolutely Mad Max. Mad Max, please. The Light of Winter or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh Brother. Oh Brother. The Light of Winter or Star Trek Beyond? <laughs> Take some Star Trek, baby. <laughs> okay. Star Trek is really just Lion in Winter in space. <laughs> oh, that's something else I wanted to, to mention. This was an interesting um, bit that I read. Uh, which I don't think I knew, but the TV show um, Empire is explicitly based on The Lion in Winter. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I've never turned it on. It says, Empire. this is what uh, uh, it says. It concerns a dysfunctional family that owns a record label named Empire, with all the members scheming and manipulating for power. There are numerous allusions to the play. The family is named Lion. The father runs an empire, while the mother, a very formidable woman, has been imprisoned for many years. Together, they have three sons, a serious, studious master manipulator son, an intelligent, talented son who is gay and the mother's favorite but rejected by the father, and a youngest son who is a favorite of the father but who is spoiled and irresponsible. The recently freed mother schemes with the father and three sons to control for control of their empire, while at the same time slinging numerous verbal barbs at each other. And it's always winter. <laughs> you must have left that part out. I had no idea that that show was uh, The Line in Winter, basically. Does it make you want to watch the show? It does. I won't, but <laughs> I, don't, I just don't, I don't have time for, for this nonsense called TV. Can do, but won't. Yes. <laughs> Delightful. What's next? <laughs> All right. The Light in Winter or Numi, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Numi, please. I'll say Numi as well. That lands the Light in Winter at 192 on our chart. 192 out of 383, which is pretty much smack dab in the middle. That's fascinating. I, I wow. Um, it, it actually performed better on my chart by a lot. And I had to re rank it. A number of times because I didn't believe it, um, but but it did legitimately head straight into my top 100. It came in at 96 out of 1,053, uh, and I, I I I tried. I tried to go back and argue with myself. I played chess with myself over it. 
Uh, but but I just couldn't get there. That's that's where it landed. It's uh, but did it, you imprison yourself? I did <laughs> briefly. See. I did well. I sat on the floor of a closet okay, and painted. How to do on your list? <laughs> I, it ended up at six ninety five out of four thousand sixty one, which is about an eighty three percent higher than I actually was expecting it to land after uh after this recent watch but uh you know i still feel it's okay it's it's a good film yeah it's not my favorite uh story of british royalty but there's a lot of interesting stuff here and it certainly is never dull that's the truth that's the truth so for me that's a 91 uh out of 191 percent it should be if i go by the algorithm it should be a four and a half star film on letterbox.com slash the next reel that feels a little high based on our conversation to to me uh where where are you landing on this i'm landing at three and a half with a like i'm definitely a like i'm definitely a big big fat juicy heart uh on this i might try to average you up a little bit at four stars okay yeah I, like- i'm okay with that I, I mean it's a film i i probably would have given a four or four and a half after the last time i watched it this time i just feel like it fell a little bit but yeah I still think there's a lot of quality there. Well, there's a lot of quality, and it's one of those movies that I'm actually, you know, as kind of now that I have reoriented myself to the kind of the nature of the intrigue, of the drama, of the family squabbles, uh, it's a film I think I'll be interested to revisit uh, because the dialogue itself is just so damned entertaining. You turd. (laughs) Best line in the movie. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it, it so, says a lot that, that that's what you gravitate to <laughs> so we're still uh we're, we're doing this uh, 1968 best picture uh, best picture series uh what yes. is next on our list next week we are looking at oliver which is the film that did win best picture for 1968 this doesn't is the, it feel like we're doing this out of order uh, you know we did it in uh, in order based on uh, alphabetical order which is how the oscars do it yeah. the only one technically we did do funny girl first which would have actually been the first one so yeah all right fair enough go on you you may continue there it is yeah so oliver next week carol reed's big musical adaptation and we're going to do the entire podcast in song me my mo <laughs> Well, if you want to hear more of us, but you can't wait until next week's show, you can support us over on patreon.com slash the next reel and get access to our exclusive members only weekend show, the Saturday matinee. We talk about movie news and new trailers. Plus, we go head to head in our weekly challenge in which we put together lists of movies related in some way to the movie we're discussing that week. There are all sorts of other goodies, too, if you support us at different levels. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. You can learn a lot more about us and check out the detailed show notes at the next reel.com. You can subscribe for free in your favorite podcast app and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at the next reel. And if you want to get into the conversation yourself, join our Discord channel for a whole lot of movie chat with movie lovers from around the world. You can find the link to join in the show notes or on the website. The next reel couldn't happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart running Instagram. Ben Lott runs all things Twitter. And thanks to Eli Catlin, who graciously allows us to use his song Ragtime Instrumental as the theme to the show. You can find out more about Eli on his SoundCloud page. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. Surely it does. Uh, we are scraping the bottom of the bottom of the barrel out of Amazon reviews at the one stars, and uh, we've got a couple. It was it was hard to choose this week. Uh, I think they just they just leapt out. Once you get past the my disc is bad reviews, <laughs> uh, there is fruit uh, that there is, is to be born. Uh, would indeed, you like to go indeed. first? Sure. I've got a one star by Emisher who says, I know this is considered a classic, but I hated it. (laughs) Watching a dysfunctional family argue and threaten each other for two hours is still uncomfortable and annoying, even if it's only a film you're watching and not the real thing. After an hour or so, it got very tiresome. Can't compare with A Man for All Seasons. Sorry, I bought this one. Oh. 
I think it's interesting that uh, Emma Schur says it is still uncomfortable and annoying, uh, <laughs> which makes me wonder what's the comparison those. that we had here. Yeah, yeah. He, he's been watching uh, Empire. <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes. Just <laughs> dipping my toe back in the water. Yes, still uncomfortable. Still uh, uncomfortable. I've got a review from uh, J. A. Urquidy who says that this is terrible. Lion in Winter, disgusting, boring, makes all the characters neurotic. I'm sure that Henry Plantagenet and Eleanor of Aquitaine were not the sad plebeians shown, shown here. Why is Eleanor talking about syphilis if she died in 1204 and the first written words of an outbreak of syphilis in Europe occurred in 1494 or 95? Wasted my money because of syphilis. <laughs> I love that this person is basing their judgment of the film on that whole line. I know. The syphilis <laughs> issue. It's like, do these people not understand history? And I don't think that Henry II peopled his bed with sheep, as she said he did as well. I don't know. <laughs> he might have. But I don't think they were peopling beds with sheep until at least 1380. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. <laughs> it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations. But it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we covered from season one up through our current season. For part of season eight, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. <sighs> Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. <laughs> wait, wait, no, that's not what I... <sighs> Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been yeah. weird. <laughs> Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! <laughs> Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Reel family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. Hey!